Hey, everybody. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 2. This is Tabitha Bird Weaver here to tell you. Trigger warning. Today, we're going to be talking about what is abuse, what are some symptoms of it, why the heck are we so confused when we are adults who have been confused or abused? Sorry, I missed that there, but you'll track with me. Um, so if this feels overwhelming for you right now, or like maybe something you want to pin and save later, please do. Mm-hmm. You deserve the space around this. So if you're going to give it a shot right now, we'll see you inside. Otherwise, we'll see you soon. Folks, welcome back. Here we are, season two, episode two of the CPTSD podcast. I am Elizabeth Pace, licensed professional counselor, supervisor, trauma therapist, in private practice, joined as ever by my colleague and counterpart, Tabitha Bird Weaver, licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed professional counselor in the great state of Oregon, close to Portland. <laughs> we'll leave it and we'll call and we're going to leave it at that. All right. We're going to leave it at that. Okay. So today, Beth, what we're going to do is start out with just like we discussed a brief overview of what is abuse and neglect. And a lot of us get that information from cultural sources like movies or TV. And a lot of us get anti-information from the very people who are abusing and neglecting us. Like, what do you mean that hurt your feelings? I was only joking would be a sign of perhaps like emotional abuse might be occurring. Right. Mm -hmm. So I just hope today that we can spend a little chunk of time talking about the different types of abuse and the different types of neglect. Um, perhaps give you some information on where you can go to support individuals you might be seeing harmed. But then I think the second part of our series today, we're going to be talking really about what it is that makes us confused about our own experience and and makes it hard to name that. So there are several different areas of abuse, and I'm just kind of going to shoot them out there real quick. Um, because they're, they're really not that confusing. (laughs) You know, we've talked about these things over time, every state. Yes. I just want to jump in first and foremost and say, this is something that I have to clarify for my clients. Often confusion is an emotion. Yeah. Confusion is painful. So when you're in that fog of like, is it, isn't it, we're going to call consistent confusion, disorientation, and a sense of not being able to like have ground under your feet in your family or in, in your, the system that you're in as part and parcel of abuse and neglect. So confusion actually goes under the umbrella, not just I'm confused because I don't know what's going on because I don't know what's going on. I am confused. And that's contributing to, uh, my, my sensations of like loss, grief, despair, pain. So I always have to stop folks and go, they're like, well, I'm just really confused. I don't know how I feel. And I'm like, confused is how you feel. Yep. And it is hard to move forward when you are confused. And so we also have this vague sense of powerlessness that can go with that. Like, I don't even know where to start. So we're going to start with one of the most obvious types of abuse um, that we all feel like we know a little bit about, at least in my world, and that is physical abuse. So physical abuse is the non-accidental injury of somebody. And it frequently is obvious to people in care professions, such as therapists, teachers, doctors, nurses, people who are able to observe others for a long period of time and different parts of their body, because physical abuse, especially if somebody is an emotional abuser, meaning they're not plotting it out and planning it because that is a sickness that happens. People do plan abuse. Yeah. Right. Um, But if it's an emotional abuse, then or an emotional response, I'm getting, I think I need to ground a little bit. I'm going to take a minute. And I would encourage you all to see this as modeling, right? So I'm recognizing that I'm hot right here. My ears are hot. I'm feeling like I can't find my words. So after all this time, it still can get you. 
And physical abuse isn't even my thing. Let me, so yeah, as Tabitha just takes a second and takes a couple of deep breaths, let me also say to you that if you are one of the people who has to say, like, avoid the news, avoid news stories about um, things that happen to children, one of that's, there's nothing wrong with being deeply touched and pained to hear that others are suffering. Um, There's something in my clinical practice, it's my experience tab, that sometimes when my clients can't get angry for their own child self, I'm like, tag me in. I can. The fact that your parent could have clacked around on the internet or gone to their uh, primary care physician and asked for help, but didn't. And then they took things out on you makes me mad. Yeah. Because there can come a time in the future, let me say in the future, where forgiveness, true compassion, understanding of the intergenerational nature of the trauma is going to be available to you if you're in this trauma treatment journey, but don't try to jump the line to get there. Oh, that yeah. There's a mound of stuff that's been swept under the rug by your family of rug sweepers that they're all like, heard this said to me in my own ear holes. Well, you know, the thing I had to do was just understand where my mother was coming from and that was really healing for me and so that's what I'm just expecting my child to do be a cycle breaker instead amen Mm -hmm. Uh, be responsible hold Mm -hmm. responsibility Mm -hmm. so as as tab takes a second to kind of cool it down there are there are schools of thought around spanking I don't actually actually have an opinion. Someone told me a story recently of their child, um, four, five, five in this story, um, unbuckling themselves from the car seat as dad is driving, as dad is like, do not do that child. Do not do that child. It is extremely dangerous. You are putting your own life in danger and I cannot, I cannot immediately like intervene. So what dad had to do was pull over as, as child had then unbuckled themselves. Five is when this happened. And dad was like, you did not do something that I asked you to do. That was integral to your, uh, to your safety, to your life and death safety. And so that is why I'm going to give you the swat on the bottom. <laughs> and that's what he got. And then by the time that five-year-old told me that story, he's like, yeah, I got a spanking from pop. And I was like, yeah, I have heard the whole story. It kind of, you know, one of the things that we can use to kind of peel away the difference between physical abuse and what your parent is doing to like help discipline or teach you lessons, does it make any sense? So in that story, I'm not here to say that like the swat on the bottom is good, bad, right, or wrong. That was that parent's choice. But there's a series of events leading up to an action that makes sense. Whereas a lot of times um, the parent will tell you in like physical abuse, the parent will tell you what I'm doing is for you. It's to discipline you. It's to teach you. Um, This hurts me more than it hurts you. Um, But if there's a randomness to when you got it, if there's a randomness to when you got that physical punishment, then that isn't necessarily about quote unquote, teaching you a lesson as much as it was about that parent taking something that they were feeling out on you. I kind of went off a little bit onto spanking, but that was just to give Tab like a second. And so what I want to do to clarify, I'm nobody's, I'm not the parenting police. So if you're a parent out there and you're doing the absolute best that you can, Tab and I are not here to judge you or shame you. What we're trying to do is if you're going well, I, w- I couldn't have been physically abused because the people who were laying any sort of hands on me were telling me that it was always for my own good, 
always for my own learning and always for my own health and healing. And they were extremely powerful psychologically. So if I'm three and someone says you're bad and then they can like tell me why and they're like 27, what sort of leg do I have to stand on to be like, no, I'm not. Well, you know, Beth, thank you so much for the space. I appreciate that. Um, I I have two things to pop in with. The first is uh, we are not the parenting police. And I would really hate for that experience or thought to stop you from listening because there is so much more for you to gain here. So if you were spanking and you feel ashamed, take a breath and take note of that. Notice you might want to change what you're doing. Research does show spanking doesn't work. Just so you know, like it, it doesn't work, but it's not considered abuse in most states unless you're using an item to spank with like a belt or a spoon. But the second, I think maybe deeper, more important thing you're talking about, Beth, for our audience at least, is the blending of physical and emotional abuse or the blending of any kinds of abuses and neglect. For example, I think I know why I got triggered. And I would like to share that just not deeply, but briefly. Um, So I did get spankings. They were always for a reason, just like you're talking about, right? And so I grew up saying, yeah, my parents spanked me, but I deserved every one of them. So if you feel like that, you're not alone and you're also not right. (laughs) It It might be something else that was going on because my spankings involved torture. So let me be more clear. It was emotional torture. You go to your room while I cool off because I'm so mad. I don't want to hurt you. So you've got to wait in your room in terror, in and, yes. anticipation. Absolutely. Oh and then there was the intimidation of listening to the belt come off down the hallway and maybe a snap, you know, how you can snap a belt. So that is emotional bull. <laughs> beep sorry I'm gonna beep that bad boy out but that is emotional bs on yeah. top of usually those spankings were because I had either directly defied my dad or embarrassed him so we could go oh, okay. into a whole nother spinoff on covert narcissism but stay tuned everybody yeah we've got another episode <laughs> right. uh the reason I jumped in or the reason I kind of raised that like fig uh finger because I'm trying not to interrupt as much but I get so excited if you're interested there's a website called the Danish way the Danish way of parenting and it talks about you know that um teaching children respect and empathy is how to parent and when I read it I was just like whoa whoa it, like it was a little bit too I don't want to say too much for me as it relates to like I couldn't understand it but I was just like my I was like right on the edge of being able to wrap my mind out around everything that they were saying but I, I like wasn't quite there you know how sometimes you read something and you're like you can almost understand the physics but you can't really um so if you're if you want to read more uh, and the woman who uh who manages that website is an American woman married to a Danish man. The reason that that's important is because she's like, I had a certain set of ideas around how parenting worked. I'm going to teach you respect by disciplining you, by spanking you, or by uh, teaching you never to defy authority. But what, uh, what the Danish way essentially purports is that teaching empathy as a skill is where um where that comes from and i also want to just tenderly invite anybody back in here teaching empathy for yourself is the inside job you have got to do first before you're going to have it to spare because if you're beating yourself up right now about like what mistakes you've ever made re parenting your kids don't shoot for perfectionism slow way down turn inwards and work on empathy for yourself. So then you have it to spare for your kids. So where we left off, if we're kind of keeping track was one of the ways that we could all meet in a room and go, well, yeah, that's wrong. And that, and we know what it looks like is physical abuse. Mm -hmm. But where tab started in was that that sounded like that was something that met a need for her dad. Right. 
And someone told me once that part of the whole spanking process included that they, the child had to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And that the contrition uh, was, that was like part of the pattern. You had to say how sorry you were. And the illusion was that if you proved how sorry you were, the punishment would be lessened in duration or could stop early. Uh, Cause again, what that's doing is taking responsibility from where it belongs with the parent down to the child, which is prove how sorry you are to me. And I'm not going to have to do this horrible thing that even I don't really want to do, but you need to be taught, you know, whatever is the lesson. So we've got physical abuse. You usually people are like, yeah, makes sense. Get a room full of people together. Usually you can come to a consensus that that's what like physical abuse is wrong and it's not that confusing but there's there's more but wait there's more what other types of abuse are you talking about tab well i think another one that we all think we know a lot about is sexual abuse and it seems obvious you know and it's the for somebody who is a minor there is no touching allowed in a sexual manner also no photographing right? No, no, even teasing is allowed sexually because it's completely inappropriate. And it's not always easy to know if that has happened to you because sometimes you can be sitting on someone's knee and it's not obvious, but it did happen. Yeah. Right. And so someone's gaze is lingering on your yep. body in yep. a way where nothing got said, nothing was initiated, no physical touch, but as children, um, oh yeah, someone, someone yesterday was saying something to me to the effect of like, I, you know, I'm, I'm as exposed and empathetic as a six-year-old child. And it made me laugh. But if you think about what it means to be a little sponge, to be like highly aware and, and vigilant of the emotional states of others around you, to feel that there's something that someone in your life wants from you that you don't understand and it makes you feel really uncomfortable and you don't have any words for that because no one has put words on it uh, because there's no other adult to go, don't leer <laughs> at my child's body if they are not watching it or they understand sexual abuse to be, you know, bright neon lights, X, Y, and Z. So there's, there's subtlety in it, which can also, again, make it confusing. Cause if you're like, I have a, I have a, I have a yuck feeling in my body when I think about X, Y, and Z person, but I don't have any evidence to point to thereby it must not have happened. Mm -hmm. And evidence is remarkably hard to find with sexual abuse because most people who participate as an abuser are planners about it. This is not a spontaneous activity that happens typically, right? I, I can really relate to that subtle layer you're talking about. For those of us who have grown up in certain denominations of churches, there's always this meet and greet during the ceremony, the ceremony, I guess it is that too, the, um, the service where you're supposed to like turn around and hug your neighbor. Every 12 year old girl in my church knew who not to sit by. So we didn't have to hug you. Mm. Know that feeling? Ugh. Mm. Ooh, that so just you, creeps. Oh. Creeps. Oh. So if you're getting that feeling for yourself or someone else, pay attention. Yeah. It's a valid, valid indicator that there is intention happening, that leering, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if you, we're talking a lot about kids right now, because this is where a lot of CPTSD starts. Yeah. So if you know a child in your life who starts wetting the bed, starts acting um, precocious sexually in a way that they didn't act before, or if you're just now noticing it, they've always been like that. Um, and this may be triggering. So take a breath. Sometimes you can smell sex abuse, literally. Hmm. So if those things are happening, please do call your state DHS um, because that needs to be interrupted. Same with physical abuse. There are hotlines in every single state in the United States that you can call to report 
even if you're just suspicious, please call because it's not your job to prove it. And in my experience, there are so many calls. Usually when I get on to make a call in the state of Oregon, I'm anywhere between number eight and 13 in line. Yeah. So all those calls are coming in. Keep making the calls because they usually need a stack before they investigate. Yeah. Right. So please do it. Um, Shall we move on? Yeah. It occurs to me also, as Tab said, take a breath. If this is too much for you today, stop this episode and go listen to another one. Brilliant. Uh, If this is too much for you today, um, honor that, recognize it in the way that Tab was like, I'm going to take a breath and hang tight for a second. You don't have to finish this episode. If this feels flooding and overwhelming, this is a very strong indication that you have something unresolved in your past. I'm not saying, well, then you must have been sexually abused if this is overwhelming. But if like, if there's some like kind of inner child part of you that is shutting down right now, don't let some sort of other performing, controlling part step in and say, well, then I have to finish this episode if this is hard for me. Hit pause. Stop Please here. do. Please Come do. Back. Yeah. Don't. That what we're talking about today is for all of you that are, have begun to experience that the confusion and the, um, the, the fog of like, what happened? Why this? Why this? Um, and that when we talk about child abuse, um, it's really, really, really painful. If you are someone who experienced any degree of emotional, physical, sexual, psychological, spiritual abuse, this is going to light your nervous system up. This is not a test. Take what you can. And I think probably it'll be a good idea for us just back in editing to do uh, a different intro that is like related to that. I think you're right. Let's let's hit it. Let's do that at the end. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And at the beginning. Three, two, one. So Beth, you are a thousand percent on. I just want to say that while I was sitting here recovering, I used probably six or seven different skills that I've been practicing for a long time. So if you think you should be able to get over it the way I did in just a few minutes, it took me years to do that. So love to you. Turn it off and take a break. Absolutely. All right. So said, shall we move on? Yes. Um, there's, um, there's the, we've talked about physical abuse. We've talked about sexual abuse. Um, is it, is it time and are we ready to move into like the subtleties of emotional and psychological abuse? I agree. And I think spiritual abuse is going to pop right in there with that because it will. (laughs) So emotional abuse is the thing in most of us with CPTSD that creates the confusion. Yeah. Right. Because all of the behaviors of our caregivers and maybe even our culture, which is again, another whole podcast about how systemically we're abusive as a culture and demand neglectful as a culture. It's nasty. Anyway, to the point (laughs) Um, that it gets twisted and it gets used against you. Right. And so that, what is one of the subtleties, Beth, that you might think is important for our listeners to know? I think one of the first, um, one of the easy places to go, yeah, that's abuse, is if you are being called names. But like, you know, I think about the way that like, there's like levels of brutality where you could look at it and you go, "That's, that's verbal abuse, wow, ouch. But what about something as subtle as like, you're being kind of like, love bombed by a parent where they're telling you that you're their best friend Mm. or that like um they just they wanted to hear your opinion about a big life decision that they should make if you're like 10 what would you what do you think i should do you're just so wise for your age this sort of stuff is like whenever you are psychologically not developed enough to be able to handle that sort of um, depth of of relationship or intimacy, we can call it 
I will say that we will call it uh, disintegrating and deeply confusing because I wouldn't, it's sometimes, it's hard to say, well, this also meets the criteria for abuse because clients will come to me and say, well, there was no way I was abused. Really, I just like, I had this experience of being my parents' everything. And for me, what I, one of the turns of phrase that I learned um, thanks to being AIT trained is invasion. If your personhood is invaded by somebody else and they'll say things like, we're kindred spirits. You and I are so much alike. That, well, then what happens when you disagree with this person or you want to tell them that you don't like the way that they're acting? Well, that doesn't really work, does it? So that for me is one of the really, um, one of the arcs that a lot of my clients have to walk through is when someone is, when, you know, when a really aggressive parent is like saying things about your sexual orientation, cause you're like very obviously queer and your parent is like just verbally abusing and beating you up about that. We're like, oh yeah, that's emotional abuse. That's verbal abuse, sure. But what about when that parent's like, um, you tell me about your day and then I'll tell you about mine. You know, like let's, we're, we are each other's soulmates who could ever come between us. That's that twisted stuff that you couldn't always put your finger on and say, well, that was abusive. But what did it, what did it leave you with? Right. And I mean, what did it leave you with was a sense of responsibility for everybody else's problems on the planet, it's except yours. And the except yours part comes because Beth, you're 100% right. That's all emotional abuse. And the flip side of that is that emotional abuse, I can't think of a time when it doesn't come with emotional neglect as well. Because if a parent is like, you sweet little thing, you come meet my needs. I'm really mad at your dad and I want you to be too. Mm-hmm. There's no care for your need as a six, seven, eight, 12, 15 year old. There's no care for your emotional development happening. It's not even on the radar. So, yeah, as you say that, when I think about the, um, the subtleties of emotional abuse, I also think about, uh, sometimes you'll hear it called Karpman's triangle or the drama triangle of a victim, a persecutor and a rescuer. Whenever a parent is expecting you to meet one of those roles, inhabit one of those roles. So in Tabitha's point, if mom is, is mad at dad and mom wants you to also be mad at dad, mom is a victim. You are her rescuer and dad is the perpetrator. And that's a story, but that can be really compelling because then like mom can't possibly be mad at you because right now she's mad at dad. So you're safe when you are in this triangulation, tri like triangulation pattern, except when you're the perpetrator and right. then you're all, all alone. Um, and trying the other thing about triangulation is that the roles, the patterns, those things can shift the bigger, the family, <laughs> the more complicated. Um, so you, you are required to align against someone if a family member of yours is angry at them. So you're getting the proxy of intimacy, but at the cost of not getting to decide how you actually feel about anything. Yeah. And I'm glad you called it a proxy because it's not real intimacy. Nope. It's the opposite. Right. And I mean, no wonder we grow up confused about how to be close to other people, especially when they don't want to use us. <laughs> right. When they want to actually be in a mutual relationship that is confusing. Yeah. Overwhelming sometimes. So I, I think that there's a couple other larger issues to talk about before we kind of keep continuing with the subtlety. And one is actual abandonment, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's also emotional abandonment. And I certainly would not sneer at the impact of that. It has long reaching impact, but some of us have actually been left by our parents and that is deeply scarring. Yeah. Yes. What did you want to say? The thing I wanted to add in there, the first time that somebody said 
uh, just in like a clinical training that I was in, the silent treatment is emotional abuse. The silent treatment is emotional abandonment. Yes. Um, that you can't get a word edgewise out of a parent because they are punishing you with their silence and their neglect. They can be in the house and you can be emotionally abandoned. What Tabitha is talking about is like literally being left for days, you know, hours, um, or just, you know, yeah, I'd be interested to hear you talk more about like being, uh, being abandoned, but I just want to add in, this is why when people go, okay, well then what Tab's talking about isn't what happened to me. So thereby this doesn't meet, this isn't bad enough to be abuse. Like in last episode, when we talked about dissociation, one of the things that, um, that folks with CPTSD love to do is go, here is the hottest, highest criteria for, for what, for what this is. And since I'm like here a little bit lower than that, it must not have been this. And that's really like, that's a survival mechanism that you can finally put down if, if the time has come. So mm -hmm. back to the tab. So I think what you're saying about the clarification is important because some of the language I'm using right now, and I'm, I'm trying to be clear about when I'm using that language is what your state will require to happen before they intervene. And I wanna tell you that that is on the far end of abuse and neglect, like imminent death is going to occur. Most CPTSD clients that I've had at least, and myself, we're in the middle. And if our families are really good, they can make it look great from the outside and it's just cancerous on the inside. And so when I'm saying things like people actually are left in truck stops. Right and trash cans. That happens. Some people experience adoption where the parent tried their best to do the best for the child, but still had to abandon the child as a very painful experience, right? Even if it was in their best interest, it's still abandonment. And so I'm really, really glad that you brought in that silent treatment piece, because guess what? Before I broke up with my family, my dad refused to speak to me for 10 days straight until I finally said, are you not talking to me? And he said, yes. <laughs> and so that's when kind of the blinders started coming off of my eyes. So if you're in a house with somebody and you know, they're not happy with you and they won't look at you, they won't answer you. They leave the room when you come in, you're being abandoned and punished. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And the responsibility falls on you to resolve it to their satisfaction. So yes. sometimes they're like, like, Hey, sorry, I lost my temper. I really didn't. Uh, I was really taking something out on you that doesn't belong to you. They're waiting for you to be like, how, what do I need to do in order for you to stop doing this to me? That's what they want. And that, that like level of responsibility for like, um, ameliorating that situation is also too big for like a 10 year old or an eight year old or a 15 year old to absorb that responsibility is too large. Uh, there's something else I want to Oh gosh, and golly, it may or may not uh, come all the way back. Shoot. Um, then I guess it doesn't. Oh, I, it was like, I was almost going to write a note of it because there was something I wanted to say to you. Um, and now it's gone. It'll come back or it won't come back. Um, th this is also, uh, this is, these are some of the places then where, um, where the gaslighting and yes. the manipulation starts to come in because I also think that those two words in the same way that like narcissism gets like, we love to splash that all over anybody if you're suffering and you're like, well, that person's a narcissist and that person's a narcissist. And like six, seven years ago, I was really attached to this idea that there are the narcissists and there are the codependents and those two people are, are this, what I understand today is that it really is. And I've said this in a podcast before, like really it's more like two sides of the same coin. If you are a narcissist, you are more than likely a very highly traumatized individual yourself. If you are a codependent person, believing that you are responsible for everyone else and the world is like pretty narcissistic. Shh. So like, don't, don't let me hurt your feelings, but like they're, it's not really, they're not really separate, but that when you go, are you not talking to me? And somebody goes, no, why are you so sensitive? <laughs> so tab is like, remember that there's the, there's the overt and then there's the subtle, the reason that it's so hard 
when someone, or when someone says like, um, there it is, it came back. Uh, that when somebody says, you know, you might have, you might have post-traumatic stress disorder and you're just like, no, I don't. And then we start kind of asking those questions of, did this ever happen to you? Did this ever happen to you? And eventually you'll hear something where like the penny will drop for you. Um, but the thing, um, what I had to just ramble until I could get back around to it, being left for days on end, let's say also as like a deputized oldest sibling where mom is going to go out and like drink or do drugs. Dad is going to be like essentially passed out on the couch or like, like catatonic on the couch, drinking beer, watching cooking shows while you make dinner for your, uh, your little siblings. You're like standing on a footstool, stirring a pot of SpaghettiOs. This is emotional abuse. So when somebody says, be a big girl, to an eight-year-old, or you be a big boy to a nine-year-old child and keep an eye on your siblings while I go into the other room and like do some sewing. Well, that's one thing. But what we're talking about is be a big girl and don't complain while I'm gone for hours at a time, or I'm like uh, completely neglecting my role in the family while you are taking the, taking the reins in this family. Yeah. That's called parentification in case anybody wants a big old word to put on that. And it means that your parent has definitely dubbed you. He might've even made you sheriff <laughs> if, if, if the substance of use gets to a certain point, you know, or, or the um, dissociation of your parent, but that piece where you have to take care of other people in order to be valuable is the thing that really creates unworthiness in us or take care of issues, right? But if you're the person, if you're the fixer, then please get yourself some support because it is overwhelming. And we don't know how to fix our own stuff. We know how to fix other people's stuff, right? right. Now you might also have the emotional abuse or neglect experience of being a scapegoat or a favorite child. And I want to let you know, we're not going to go super deep in that, right? But scapegoats basically bear the burden of the family. They're the problem. If only you weren't this way, then everything would be fine in our family. And the favored child is the goal or the golden child is another thing it's called is the person who does everything right, regardless of whether it's good or not, right? And I just want to point out that a lot of people think the golden child hasn't made. They do not. Some things are easier for them in childhood on the outside, but they have had to sell out their soul to be okay. Scapegoats are usually people who push back. We rage against the, I was a scapegoat for sure, where we rage against the machine. We, we see the, the hypocrisy that's happening in our parent and we call it out or we don't tolerate it. So we're, we've must be gotten rid of. Does that make sense? Sure. You know, or put down. So if you feel like you are a scapegoat or a golden child and you have a sibling relationship that's ruptured, that may or may not be reparable. I don't know, but I would encourage you to have empathy both ways. Well, and the one, the one, you know, the one role perhaps that we've, um, so the golden child can also sometimes have to be like the, uh, the performer, like the, um, I can't remember what the, the name is and like family roles in, in dysfunction. Um, but if you're the one who's like making everybody laugh and, you know, telling jokes and, you know, you're, cause you can be the perfectionist and the performer without necessarily being the golden child. And then lest we forget, there's the lost child. Mm -hmm. And you just sort of have disappeared because you are neither this nor that. You have seen that both of them are like extremely costly or maybe you want to be the golden child, but like, that's not going to happen because your sibling already is. And so you disappear. And then your, uh, your parents can say things like, oh, uh, this child just likes to figure things out by themselves. They've always been easy. They don't, they just don't tell, they just don't say what's going on their mind. You know, I mean, if you ask, they just won't talk to you. And it's just like, we can scratch the surface a little bit deeper. Now, we are, um, there's a, there's a place I want to touch, which is 
maybe not subtle, but just more, more as it relates to, to generally. When, whenever, so we're talking about like being love bombed by a parent, or we're talking about being their favorite. Um, and that's costly. That's costly. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is if you were to talk to your adult siblings about which role they thought you had versus which role they thought they had, you get a lot of like really mixed up stories. Um, but which is a tactic. I wanna, yeah, which I, what I want to come back to <clears throat> is if your parent has previously unmet needs that they are making you fill that's going to impede your ability to develop as yourself because you are going to be overwhelmed by their needs, overwhelmed by their invasiveness. And you are going to create a false self to meet their needs such that you won't know necessarily who your authentic self is until you start doing this waking up stuff. It might really surprise you. You might find out that you like things that you didn't know you liked, or you might find that you can feel what you don't like and can articulate it without having to like stuff it, stuff it, stuff it, stuff it, stuff it, stuff it until it explodes in a rage that really surprises the people in your life who are like, well, then why did you keep saying that this was okay with you? And you're like, because that's always been my job. Um, so what else do you want to add before we talk in, um, we talk just a little bit about like, uh, you know, what to do. I think the thing I want to add is that we can all agree, as you were saying before, that physical abuse, sexual abuse, abandonment, as especially as we're talking about in state defined terms, right? What's legal or versus Ill, illegal um, is it's not always obvious, but it, it's easier to see and to name emotional abuse and neglect other than, you know, poverty, by the way, is not considered neglect. So if you are short on money, but you're doing everything you can to get, get your kids to school, medical care, food, all of that, that's not neglect, right? So I just want to encourage you <laughs> if you're in that situation, these experiences we have of emotional neglect, spiritual neglects, which we haven't even talked on. I think maybe we'll save that for its whole episode because it's a doozy. Um, they actually leave neuroreceptive damage in your brain, the same as physical abuse. It hurts like physical abuse. So if you're getting slapped around with words or punishments, emotional punishments, instead of hit, you're still getting damage in your brain and you deserve the space to heal that. So and I just want you to know, it's not serious. It's not something you should get. It is serious. It's not something you should just get over. And you can, you can kind of watch for the signs when you listen to the way you talk to yourself. I once did an intake with a client of mine um, who was like, I just can't really, I can't really put my finger on what's wrong. Um, and so I, I'm asking questions and I'm asking questions as is my responsibility and my job. I start noticing how many times they're saying something about like how lazy, how stupid they are. Yep. Um, and then I ask them, you know, tell me about your relationship with, um, with your parents. And they're like, they're so great. They are so good. I am so lucky to have them. They are, they are like, they're the best. They are so good to me. And eventually the time came where I was like, then who taught you how to talk that way about yourself? Yep. Who taught you how to talk that way about yourself? Uh, like what I heard in the intake, do you know how many times you just called yourself lazy? And I was like, it was nine. I started keeping like tally marks to count. <laughs> they were just like, whoa, no, I didn't. Because their parents were telling them that they were great parents and that this kid was so lucky and that the only reason that there was any kind of problems in the house was because this kid was lazy, ungrateful. And then of course, you know, these children, not always, but sometimes manage to do things like move away, move away. And then the parent can start like, I don't want to say abusing because like this, we're talking about adults now, right? Um, and if someone, if someone is talking to you in a particular way, it can be emotional abuse, but we're not talking about the same level of like helpless and powerlessness as we are in childhood, that the parent can all of a sudden be like, 
well, I'm dead, you know, how are you doing? Well, I'm just like pretty sad because, you know, all my friends' kids live here and they get to see their grandkids and, you know, you live one state over and you never come see me. And it's still, there's just, sim it's symptomatic of the same ill, which is you are responsible for my emotions instead of that adult being responsible for their own emotions. So again, when your parent has previously unmet needs that they want you to fill, you are, you are going to be struggling in a way that folks, parents, because listen, listen, you don't have to be perfect to be an adequate parent. Right. You can realize you have previously unmet needs that you need to go do something about. Talk to your spouse, talk to your, like, get some help, but that you can, if you've got even just tab, we'll talk about that pause. And I'll say that like a nanosecond, a millisecond of space between what you want to say to your child and then what you maybe have, how you've decided you are going to respond instead of react. You don't have to be perfectly healed to do a better job. Mm. But if you are dis ambiguating, I don't think that's the word I wanna use. If you are untangling like how you feel from how you're parenting as best as you are able in this moment in time, then you can call yourself one of the cycle breakers. You can call yourself that. What else do you want to add before we wrap things up today? Um, <clears throat> I think what I want to add is I'm a cycle breaker because I remember the day my dad's finger came out of my hand at my kid. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, we are not doing this. And it took a lot of work to learn how to take that pause, Beth. So I just want to return to the idea of having empathy and compassion with yourself. Because guess what? If you're recognizing that, you've already taken a step beyond what your parents ever did. Nice work. Nice work. Please keep going. Your kids deserve it. You deserve a good relationship with your kids. So they're not calling you or you're not, you know, from one state over saying, I don't want to come home, mom. You never talk to me right. The other thing I want to add is with verbal and emotional abuse, I also want you to remember the obvious thing like name calling, super derogatory comments, your fat ass, stuff like that. I'll beat the ass out. <laughs> but, um, you know, those types of things are obvious emotional and verbal abuse. But there is other subtleties to it that I want you to be aware of, especially tone and body posturing. Like over 90% of our communication comes through tone and through expression. And so if you're like, I love you. What's wrong with you that you don't know that I love you? The love you words are coming out and hate is coming with it. So if you're right. getting that crap, find a way to change relationships. I know that that's hard, but people who treat you like this have a very hard time changing it. The recidivism rate for abusers of all types is remarkably high because they don't want or have the insight they need to change. What hurts? It, it really hurts. And so I'm not trying to be mean. To them, I'm trying to protect you, you who are coming awake and are willing to tolerate what you need to tolerate to learn how to be you. We want you to be your whole self, not these fragmented parts that abuse and neglect create, and you can do it. So that's my, my one in is that if any of this has triggered you today, look into that. Not right now, right? Take, give yourself a break. If any of it is resonating with you, take steps, figure it out. And the place I would start to just to keep it simple is go take the ACEs survey, mm. A-C-E. It is, oh my gosh, I just lost what that means. Beth, can you help me out there? Adverse childhood experiences. Thank you. <laughs> my perfectionist was, was like accomplished childhood experiences. That's not it. That if you've got it. adverse childhood experiences or you're noticing that this guy's just like my dad or I married my mom, take those things to heart and get yourself some support. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing all of that. There's, there's a couple of things I want to add. One of them is if you ever watched your parent or caregiver abuse someone else in front of you, yeah. we're going to say that that meets the criteria for abuse. Yep. 
if you have ever heard the screams of a sibling or a step sibling or a half sibling, because that parent will never lay a hand on you, but they'll beat your brother, no problem. And that I had one to, to the effect of what you were saying before that whole, like, I love you. Okay. Like ugh, miss me with that. Um, but that one of my clients told me that they had a father that would like gesticulate, oh. like I could hit you, but I'm not going to do it. But that you need like you, that reads hypervigilance. So nobody ever hits you, but that like, I'll raise a fist just so you know that that is a possibility, even if I never do it. Yeah. So I want to, so on the, on the level of, you know, um, that extremity and then back to the, the realm of subtlety, there are, uh, I once asked a client, um, with like some, some pretty extreme dissociation. They were like, I just don't understand why I keep forgetting how bad it is to hang out with my parents. And then I go back and hang out with them. And I'm like, I think it's because of trauma related dissociation such that one day I was like, let me ask you to do some of your own psychoeducation on the internet about enmeshment and symbiosis. And they came back a couple of weeks later and they were like, oh, I forgot to do that. And I was like, I think it's because of the dissociation. I'm just going to read a couple of things about pathological symbiosis. The other thing I just want to like applaud AIT one more time in AIT for attachment, the training for attachment rupture, there's a whole component for adding which brain parts have been affected by this attachment trauma. Uh, this is one of the reasons that like, once you really, that's one of the reasons Tab and I work so hard on supporting research collection for AIT. And we're in an AIT teacher training because we want more people to be AIT therapists because we think it's so worth it. It's so good. And that if the demand continues to increase for AIT therapists, then the supply will increase as well. Uh, if someone says, well, I, what I really want is an AIT therapist and I can't find one, like people in your community are going to understand that they need to go get that training. I'm going to read just a couple of um, things to you so that you can, you can understand that like, this is also abusive, but it would not look to anyone on the outside except a skilled set of eyes that this is really destructive for that child. Um, parental neediness, child is caretaker in some way, child is trained to function as the fulfiller of mother or father's needs rather than their own. For the child, the relationship becomes caring for others. That's what relationship means. Um, the child does what the parent says in the hopes that they will be loved, mirrored, protected, nurtured, given attention, et cetera. But there's always one more thing that the child has to do before getting their needs met. Um, and when the love, et cetera, is given, it is somehow toxic. So the goalposts are always moving of what you need to give you know, it's like having the carrot of love dangled in front of you in exchange for complete control of your life or you meeting their emotional needs or whatever it is. But the, the goal, it's always like the one more thing. And so what this, I would say, at least in my experience of how this looks like in adulthood is this like phenomenal craving and seeking. So someone mm -hmm. who will stay in one place and be like, I love you. Let's get to know each other deeply for someone who was trained in their childhood for what relationships are like, like that. It's like, what you need to be running away from me. You need to be like breadcrumbing me <laughs> so that I can chase you and giving me like a little bit, because that's the only thing that like excites my nervous system such that I understand that this is love. Cause if you're just stable, what, what do you do with that? that? What do I want with that? And so we, um, I've heard you say on more than one occasion now in this, this episode, if you're watching somebody be abused or neglected, there's a good, there's a good faith reporting, like um, essentially 
if you, if you Google that or you internet search good faith reporting, you're not going to get in trouble for saying, I think there's something going on here. Yep. You're just, you mm-hmm. are just reporting what would be the suspicion of child abuse or neglect. You are not the one who has to do the data collection. You mm-hmm. are not the one who has to, you just have to say, this is what I think. This is what I think. And, and in most states you can report with anonymity. Yeah. All right. Further, further. If you want to turn this around and face it towards yourself. And this is something I I told Tab that I was going to offer that if I ask, I have to ask my clients to do this. Sometimes the way that I ask them to do this is to look at a stock photo of a 12 year old on the internet. I'm like, pull up 12 year old boy and look at them. Does it seem right that that 12 year old should be parenting and and caring for their other, you know, five siblings? Or does it seem right that that 12 year old would be in a sexual relationship with like a 27 year old teacher? Does that, does, does that work in your mind? And the other way I'll ask people to do this kind of more to EMDR um, and attachment trauma resourcing is they're going, well, yeah, you know, that, that kid should just have to figure it out by themselves. Cause like they're 14, they're already blah, blah, blah. And then if we set the scene of the parent neglecting the child or the parent engaging, whatever is the behavior, saying the words, um, responding or reacting. And then we introduce just another pair of eyes. So if you want it to be me and Tabitha, let it be us. Imagine Tran- teleporting me, adult Beth and adult Tab into this scenario. And then just watch what happens when now there's like a pair of like functional enough, resourced enough adult eyes to go, what did you just say to that 10 year old? And then if we had an ideal, if it was ideal and since it's your imagination, it is. If we have an ideal enough set of circumstances, what would you like to have happen? And this is one of the things I'll ask my clients, who's going to go comfort that child and help them understand that what's happening here doesn't have anything to do with them. And a lot of times my client, depending on where they are in the journey is like, I'll do that. And I'm like, great, let me go talk to that adult and be like, (laughs) who taught you how to parent this way? What's going on in your mind and in your heart right now, as you're saying these words to this child? Because Tabitha and I work with abusers. We have, and it's our job to have compassion for them, not their children's. It is not their children's job to be their only emotional resource. There are people like me and Tab all over this world. We are not exceptional in that way who can empathetically say, okay, so you yelled at your kid again. Let's talk about what the repair needs to look like. Not that you need to try and commit to be perfect. You know, and I'm, I didn't lose the thread. I'm gonna cycle back. But if you're going, well, but it does it make the criteria, does it really meet the criteria for abuse? And then you engage in that imaginal exercise and you go, it feels yucky. Then I'm here to tell you, you might have the suspicion that yeah. it was abusive. And that's enough for you, at least in your own work to, to do, some more, um, do some more research. Amen, Beth. <laughs> Do you have anything you'd like to say before we say goodbye for today? If you listened to this episode, celebrate that. Yeah. If you listen to it in 17 parts, because you could handle about eight minutes at a time, celebrate yourself. Totally. If you are, if you have found yourself to like, if you have found yourself here watching this on YouTube or listening to this on podcasts, celebrate yourself. Mm -hmm. What it means is that the wheels of change are already in motion for you or otherwise you wouldn't be here. Absolutely. And you have already done more than you may know, right? You may have already done some of the most important work of this whole journey. Yes. All right. Well, again, celebrate yourself. We're so glad that you were here. I'm really hopeful that this was helpful to you. Please remember that it's not only kids who get abused, people who are differently abled, 
people who are older in our society and um, <clears throat> people who maybe are new to our society, right, um, are frequently targeted. So please be kind to yourself, be kind to others. We'll see you in episode three. If this resonated with you, please leave a comment, give us a like, subscribe. We have a Facebook page. We don't put a lot out there except for our podcasts, but you can go there and check in. Um, see if there's a community there that you might like to create with others who are following us. We really look forward to supporting you and we appreciate your support. See you in a couple weeks. Bye guys. Thanks. Thank you.